Good morning and welcome to Light Reflections from First Friends. We are glad you have chosen to join us for this virtual worship service and hope you find it beneficial to your spiritual journey. We consider this an abbreviated version of our in-person meeting for worship for those wishing to join us from a distance. If this is your first time joining us, First Friends is a thriving, progressive Quaker meeting in the city of Indianapolis, Indiana. We consider ourselves a loving, inclusive, joyous gathering of people seeking to know truth under the leadership of God's Spirit. All are welcome, no matter race, age, cultural background, sexual orientation and identity, marital status, physical and mental ability, family structure, or economic circumstance. Our hope is that through this worship experience, you will discover our faith community is unlike any other, where silent meditation is as important as the spoken word, where we emphasize the importance of one's personal encounter with the divine, and where we seek to support one another as we discover truth together. Now we invite you to center down and enter this virtual worship space with us. Good morning, friends, and welcome to Light Reflections from First Friends. Our scripture for this morning is from Philippians 4, 8-9 from the Message Version. Summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious. The best, not the worst. The beautiful, not the ugly. Things to praise, not things to curse. But into practice, put into practice what you learned from me, what you heard and saw and realized. Do that, and God, who makes everything work together, will work you into his most excellent harmonies. Last week, I used a term that has had many of us talking. Actually, Jim Carthall told me it was the main topic of discussion last Sunday with those who stayed to consider my message. That term was systemic goodness what early friends called the transforming power of love. What I've learned this week is in all the conversations I've had and the feedback I've received 
is that there is more to systemic goodness than we may first think. To be able to grow, sustain, and perpetuate systemic goodness, we must first be people of integrity. And I would go as far as saying to have systemic goodness, we first must have systemic integrity. To explain what I mean, I'm going to borrow some ideas from Richard Uglow of Enrich You from an article he wrote about systemic integrity. But even before I do that, I want to start with some definitions because I believe part of the problem today is that we do not know what all we are talking about when we talk about integrity. Just because for us Quakers, integrity is one of our spices or testimonies doesn't automatically make it something we are good at or even recognize as important. The English Dictionary describes the word integrity in the somewhat 2D words of moral uprightness, completeness, wholeness, soundness, and honesty. The thesaurus moves into a more 3D positioning by describing integrity as incorruptibility, togetherness, and perhaps in a more systemic context, oneness or unity. On Quaker.org, it comes straight out and claims integrity is hard to define. But then it says this, at a more fundamental level, living in integrity means accepting accountability for one's actions and repenting when one has done harm to others. It means honoring that of God and other people, which includes treating everyone with dignity and with an open mind. You may not always agree with someone, but you can disagree no matter how firmly with respect. Richard Uglow made it hit closer to home when he said this, when any of us engage with the idea, let alone the choice to behave with integrity, the challenges begin. We have to face ourselves. And in facing ourselves, we usually find that none of us are yet the finished article. There is a humility with integrity that must be foundational for goodness and love to grow and along with the humility always comes risk. We don't like to be humbled. Actually, our world often downplays humility, which makes it even more of a risk. To realize we're not the finished articles can sometimes leave us living lives that are, well, mediocre, unchallenged, isolated, or even myopic. All growing problems in our world today. Where most of us become challenged with our humility is where other people are involved because selfishness does not take much humility or risk. Even most of the famous historical quotes about integrity seem to position the quality of integrity as a personal quest. Integrity being some kind of high ideal of character or life quality or life mission or life compass. But looking at integrity through those lenses make it have a black and white reality to it. Either you have it or you don't. Individually, that may seem to work, but we're not just individuals. We are communal people connected to one another. Families, communities, meetings, pickleball clubs, book groups, business networking teams, AA meetings, etc. We're all about connecting with other people. Just think about it, or better yet, let's ponder some queries that I adapted from Richard Uglow. What happens in a community of people if lack of integrity is the cultural norm that is allowed to prevail? What happens to a community of people when half the individuals choose integrity and the other half don't? What happens to a community when leaders, directors, and authorities behave selfishly? with power and for personal gain at the expense of those they serve and justify their action as just societal norms that they assume are accepted by everyone. I could easily just say, look around you or turn on the news. I strongly believe integrity is the most impactful and powerful when it is lived out within relationship, within communities and within societies. Yet when we choose integrity, when dealing with our neighbors, our family and friends, it also means we choose to be powerless. Again, there's sacrifice like I talked about last week. The sacrifice is so those around us may also flourish and grow along with us. That's part of the humility and the risk I was talking about earlier. To create systemic integrity means we have a choice to make. 
Will it be simply for my gain? That's the individual part. Or will it be a decision that will impact those we interact with and live with and love? A huge part of integrity itself is coming to accept and understand this collective dimension of life. It seems like it should be no, a no-brainer that we would want to choose integrity as a best practice. This was Jesus' charge to us. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now let's be honest. Most of us are not good at following this charge. We've been taught from early on that our success and survival is the key. Thus, the reason why integrity cannot simply be about personal integrity. Again, that's where it starts, but it must translate from our personal lives to living out integrity in our world. That's loving our neighbor as you love yourself. The sad reality in our world today is that we simply do not trust or respect each other anymore. And those who are living under people without integrity have lost the power or authority to make the authorities change or mature in their integrity. This is why people leave jobs, leave relationships, even leave Quaker meetings, because it's easier and safer to move on than to confront the dysfunction, corruption, and lack of integrity of someone in a place of power and authority. Integrity and trust must go hand in hand. Yet please hear me on this. You and I are not powerless nor helpless. You and I can offer the path of integrity as a better way. Yes, it will take some humility and it'll take some risk and a lot of trust. But as Quakers, you and I can agree to live out a testimony of integrity within our daily lives and with our neighbors. As the Mandalorian would say, this is the way. In our testimony of integrity, it says integrity is the way many members of the Religious Society of Friends, Quakers, testify or bear witness to their belief that one should live a life that is true to God, true to oneself, and true to others. Early Quakers took this testimony and built frameworks, or what today we would call best practices for family and meeting and community and even societal life. They realized as we should still in our day, that integrity requires that we always do the right thing for the common good. Self, family, working family, and human family, by design, when no one is watching us, in our darkest hour, and in all our day-to-day -day dealings. When we again come around a common testimony of integrity, then we are actively walking in the direction of systemic integrity, no matter one's education, culture, economic status, race, sexual gender, identity, or religious beliefs. And I could list more, but that would be a good start. More and more, I hear the voices of our millennials and Gen Zers crying foul and calling out us older generations for failing to address the corruptions and the lack of integrity by saying to us, shame on you and asking, why have you not addressed or called out this disease in our families and politics and workplaces and economics and environmental and religious institutions? And they're not just crying out. They're getting educations. They're becoming vocal activists and working for systemic and real change. These generations are making me ask the following queries. Have we lacked the courage to be people of integrity? Have we been blindly accepting and complicit in the lack of integrity in our day? How are we creating and modeling systemic integrity at First Friends? Where might we need to do some work? Friend Shelley uh, E. Cochran of Rochester, New York uh, meeting warned us saying this, often our reluctance is more a matter of convenience than principle. Most times I think we fudge because we simply find it easier to go quietly along than to witness. Faced with social pressures, many of us choose the path of least resistance. This is clearly going to be a communal effort, folks. We are going to need each other to stand up and make our voices and lives heard. Yes, it will have to start with our personal in integrity, but it must not stop there. Let me close with the words of Shelley Francis from The Courage Way. It takes courage to create a meaningful life of integrity. 
It also requires good company and practice. Amen. Now, as we enter waiting worship, we will take some time to ponder the queries I just shared. Building bridges between our divisions, I reach out to you, will you reach out to me? With all of our voices and all of our visions, friends, we could make such sweet harmony. Building bridges between our divisions, I reach out to you, will you reach out to me? With all of our voices and all of our visions, friends, we could make such sweet harmony. We close this time of worship with a Quaker prayer. God, open our eyes 
and unstop our ears, that we may see your light and may hear your heartbeat reflecting and resounding within our chests, in those of all our neighbors near and far, in all creatures and plants, and in the ground we walk upon. When we finally are able to yield to the leading of your rhythm and flow, may we come to walk cheerfully over the world, answering that of you in all. Amen. Have a great week, friends.